the Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 734 for Monday, November 5th, 2018. Good greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab. The show where we take your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, we mix it all together, we answer your questions, we do what we can so that every single one of us, every single time we get together, which is every single week, learns at least five new things. Sponsors for this episode include PDF Pen from the good folks at Smile, Captera, we're at captera.com slash MGG, you can get the uh, a free free cool thing that we'll tell you about ring.com slash mgg we'll tell you about a new thing they're doing and a new sponsor ops genie now from atlassian at ops we'll talk more about all of those shortly here but for the moment here in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton and here in fearful connecticut this is john f Braun. How you doing this morning, Mr. John F. Braun? I, I say this morning because for you and me, it's morning. I, I, I accept the time shifting nature of things, especially this week with the time having shifted for many of us, at least here in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. What's that? A pain in the neck. Um, I've, set all my, I've set all my clocks. Yeah, you know, less and less, I have to do that. So I have to change my uh, grandfather clock which, uh, you know, of course, is mechanical. I do have to change all of my mechanical watches, which, um, you know, is, is a, the struggle is real. Uh, but uh, and I have an old Radio Shack realistic clock radio next to my bed that I have to change. But um, but other than that, like all my thermostats now and well, most of my thermostats, I should say, I have a couple that uh, that I haven't switched over to electronics yet. But everything in the cars, you got to switch over. But everything else kind of just, you know, does it. Oh, the cuckoo clock, too. I did that this morning. I like I like my mechanical time pieces, I suppose. And, that, you know, there you go. Yeah. So I got a terrible email this morning. What did your email say, John? <sighs> CCC backup task. Backup failed. That CCC oh. being carbon copy cloner for those of you fl- playing along at home. So what what caused the failure? Correct. And of course, you can have a carbon copy cloner email you when things don't go well. And uh, here was the error. It says the destination volume is present, but could not be mounted. Mm. Uh Oh, that sounds like a dead hard drive, man. Or dying. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. Fair. Yep. So I had it plugged in to the the Mac directly into the Mac. Okay. uh, Sometimes, you know, cycling power works. Absolutely. In this case, it didn't. I plugged it into my USB 3 hub and then it mounted. So something, I don't know if there's something with the the mini or the drive. I suspect the drive may be dying. It's an old uh, rotational uh, two and a half inch yeah. drive. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, cool. um, you know, I decided to do, um, I'm like, you know what? And, and then I came across a, a tweet uh, from the, the folks over at uh, Tech Review. Yeah, and, that MGG uh, Gym. So there you go. Yeah. Yep. And um, well, apparently uh, Amazon has a one terabyte SanDisk Ultra 3D SSD for the amazing low price, which I was shocked at how little it was. 144 bucks. 145 today. 144.99. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's pretty good. That's price pretty good. <laughs> SSD. Yeah. Um. So yeah, so I'm gonna uh, you know retire those uh, old rotational drives. I, I back up both both my machines. I do a CCC backup. Smart, either automated or uh, or manual. So um, so I figure you know retire those drives before before they die. Yeah, I mean it's yeah. a redundant backup. I do a time machine backup of both machines as well. Sure, sure. Well, it's good to have multiples, and and I I don't want to gloss over the backup notifications, right? I, cause I do the same thing. I have carbon copy cloner. I've got a couple different things running, but carbon copy cloner clones, no less than three machines for me each day. The, the iMac's here in the studio and uh, office. And then my wife's iMac over at the house. 
And I actually have it set to email me for both success and failure. And the reason I do that is because if Carbon Copy Cloner stops running for some reason, I will not know uh, because it won't be there to email me that it had a problem. Right. So I am very used to and I, you know, I, I have it filtered in my email. So it goes into a certain box. But I will know I know that at some point, if, if, if those stop cloning themselves, first of all, all three would have to stop cloning for no email to be in that that filtered place. But uh, even if that were to happen, I would pick up on that within about a week, you know, be like, well, hey, wait a minute. I haven't gotten my successful backup notifications. Uh, what's going on? And it's really simple. I wake up every morning and just delete them. And if I've been traveling and I haven't looked, I can go delete three days worth. It's just not a big deal. But that way I am, uh, you know, it's just part of my routine to delete those emails. And I, it makes me feel more comfortable because I, like I said, I, I, I at least know that they're happening. And I think I'd pick up on the fact that they were not. So, so. There you go. Backup notifications are a good thing because you want to know if if your backup. I mean, it's also good to test your backups yourself, but it's especially good to know if your backup software thinks there's a problem. So, yeah, good on two counts. Yeah, that's one one thing where Time Machine isn't that great. Right. I've had occasions where on my mini, you know, if you click on the uh, Time Machine menu. Yeah. It'll tell you the last time it did a backup. And there was one time where I looked and it was like a week ago. And I'm like, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I think I had to uh, uh, remove and then re-add the uh, destination uh, to the time machine. Uh, oh, yeah. System <laughs> preference. And then, yeah. Got, then it got happier. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why I got confused. Because it's time machine, man. That's why. Yeah. All right. Let's... um. Let's go through some of your, we've got some questions. We've got a question and a couple of tips uh, we'll, we'll start with. And then, and then we get to talk about new Mac hardware that that's pretty cool to me. So uh, let's go. Uh, Alan, he writes, can either of you explain how the mobile documents slash iCloud folder works? If I navigate to home library mo mobile documents, I can see a folder with that name. But if I click on the folder, suddenly the finder displays the top of my iCloud drive. What's the difference? So th th really, there is no difference, right? That behavior is as intended, and it is simply a change uh, or an intentional remapping or redisplay that the finder shows you, right? Because that iCloud folder is just iCloud in name and function, but it is actually home library mobile documents. It is iCloud Drive, and iCloud Drive syncs everything to home library mobile documents on your Mac. I, I haven't dug into a jailbroken iPhone, but it wouldn't surprise me if home library mobile documents is where it also syncs that stuff on your iPhone, because it's at the core very much the same OS. Um, Apple, like I said, just coded the Finder to display iCloud so that casual users would not be confused, saying, hey, wait, why is the contents of my iCloud drive here in this mobile documents folder, right? So they are one in the same and, and you don't need to worry, but it's a good catch, man. Like I, I, I like it. It's good. That's why I wanted to include it in the show. Good stuff. Thoughts on that, John, before we, uh, before we move on to a couple of tips here. Um, yeah, I guess, the, uh, yeah, I guess it could be confusing. Uh, another kind of related thing is that if you, uh, you know, so if you go to iCloud, um, iCloud and then the, the, the click on iCloud Drive and then options. Uh, there's also something that may be, may be kind of weird for some people. And there's the uh, desktop and documents folder checkbox there. And if you check that, your documents folder will move. Or at least that's what I found. Oh, that's right. It doesn't, it, that's, you, you're talking about the, the checkbox to, tell iCloud whether or not to sync your desktop and documents folders, mm. right? Yeah, but it doesn't just sync them, it moves them. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it actually puts it in yeah, because it kind of threw me when, when they introduced this feature. Because um, I had my documents folder in my sidebar and all of a sudden when I did this, it, it went away and I'm like, well, where'd it go? Yeah. Well, where it goes is it goes to iCloud Drive, documents and then within that uh, another documents folder. Interesting. 
Okay. So that, that then, cause I don't do the desktop and document syncing. So those folders now for you live inside of this home library, mobile documents folder. Is that right? Um, yes. Oh, so I had, so I, I, so I put a different, um, so I, I recreated the, uh, the shortcut to the documents folder in the sidebar in my sidebar. Yeah. Yes. That makes sense. Sure. Yeah. 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 Smart. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Wow. Thanks for that. Yeah. I totally forget about that. You know, it's easy to lose sight of the things that you don't use every day. So cool. Mm. All right. Listener, Kevin says back in the pre Mojave days, I had my Macs configured with the dark doc and dark menu bar. And I really liked that. I agree. Actually. Uh, he says, when Mojave came out, I gave dark mode a try, but it was just too much for me personally. He says, I didn't love the look of apps like mail, but I didn't hate it either. He says, I just couldn't handle switching between apps like mail, which does all the text in dark mode, at least the non HTML text in dark mode uh, and Safari, where 99% of the websites have a white background. Uh, he says it was just too jarring for me. And I agree with you. This is why I turned off dark mode almost as soon as I turned it on. Uh, he says, so I switched back to light mode, but I didn't like the white menu bar and light dock. He says, I didn't want to have to pick between the two. So I came across an article at OS 10 daily, which we will link in the show notes. He says via a simple terminal command followed by a log out and log back in. He says, uh, then making one change in system preferences, I can have my dark dock and menu bar back without full on dark mode, just like high Sierra and before. Life is a tad bit better, and I wanted to share this with you and our uh, fellow listeners. It says, in hopes of making someone else's life a little bit better, too. And so, yeah, there's a, um, I'm looking at this article here. It's a, it's a default write command, and I'm not even going to try to share it here because it, you won't remember. I certainly won't remember, but we'll put it, <clears throat> excuse me, in the show notes. And, uh, and there you go. So have you messed with, what, what are your thoughts on dark mode, John? No, sir. Yeah. I'm like, nah. I tried it and I'm like, nah. yeah, same, <laughs> same. Yeah. The, the, he, he, he actually articulated it really well. The, the mail, if you live in mail and Safari all day, having this, you know, light background in Safari and, and dark background in mail is just, it's jarring switching back and forth between them. I grok why Safari has to have the white background on web pages because that's how web pages are coded. And in mail, jumping from message to message, you get for text messages, messages that are actually sent as text and don't have any formatting, you get black background or dark background and, and light text. But as soon as you jump to a message that is HTML formatted, you get whatever that's supposed to be, which most times is light background with dark text. So it's just, it, it's, it's too much. I wish with mail specifically, I could turn off dark mode for that. I might feel differently about dark mode if I could control it on an app by app basis. And with some apps you can actually third party apps, you can mail is not a third party app and doesn't seem to have that setting. So very cool, Kevin. Thanks for sharing that. That's good. We've, uh, we've got that in the show notes for everybody there. So very, very cool. And then we got a note from Johnny, who is the author of data man pro and he uh, he wanted to make sure we knew that uh, Siri. So Data Man Pro lets you totally manage and see how much data you've used, cell data, Wi-Fi data on your phone and iPad so that you can manage, you know, up to your data limits if you're not on an unlimited plan or uh, otherwise need to be aware of that. And he says now Siri can automatically turn cellular data on and off when you're in danger of exceeding your data cap. Uh, he says this is made possible by using Data Man Pro in your custom shortcuts. So I love this stuff. I really like seeing uh, that sort of thing. I would love to see it all back on the watch with shortcuts, but you know, that's just how it goes. So pretty cool, huh, John? Do you use you have a limited data plan? So do you use Data Man Pro nowadays? No, I used to. Yeah. Um, until Verizon decided to uh, create a widget that tells me how much data i have left aha there you go oh that's actually, yeah I'm that's even right better now. Yeah. actually i'm looking right now and it says you're low on data i have 0. 0.45 of two gigs remaining oh when it when that's is your reset date left. oh okay all right oh so six it's not days. the first of the month or anything so you're, you're you'll, you'll do all right you'll make it you'll make it. yeah it should be okay usually yeah. when uh when i travel into uh manhattan is when uh 
when I consume data because I don't have the, the Wi-Fi. Oh, Wi-Fi around. Yeah. Yeah. I have here. All right. But, so um, I, I have. Then, oh, go ahead. And then what they do also, and actually this happened to me once, and it, it's not terrible, but what Verizon does, I think you can put, I think they call it safe mode. But what happens is if you deplete your data, um, I think they, they'll knock you down um, to 3G speeds. So you won't get LTE. Okay, so you don't have you don't get overage charges. You just get um, you, you I, just I get can, throttled essentially. I, I chose to get throttled, but the, mm. they'll also let you you know buy more data if you want. Of course, to. they're like, oh, you're getting close. You want you want to add add a little data this month? That's or really you just slow, add, though. Wow. Or do you just, or do you just want to have you know three G speeds until uh, yeah until next month? Right, right, yeah, until the reset. Huh? Cool. Hey, all right. So in the uh, in the chat room here at MacGeekGab.com slash stream, listener Alex looked and helped. And he found an article on HowToIsolve.com entitled How to Turn On and Turn Off Dark Mode for Email and Mail App Only on Mac OS Mojave. So there is, uh, I'm looking, you launch the app, you go to Preferences, you go to Viewing Action, Ah, there is an option in mail. Who knew? Well, evidently these people and not me. Uh, So if you go to preferences, viewing, this is in mail. There is a checkbox that says use dark backgrounds for messages. Turn it off and boom, it goes away. Oh, this is pretty good. Nice. Thanks, man. Very good. All right. So I might try dark mode again. Cool. I will try it when I am back from, uh, from Mac Tech. Which I am leaving for actually the day this show releases. So um, if you're in LA, come say hello because I would, uh, it would be great to see you at Mac Tech. And on Thursday, I'm speaking about mesh Wi Fi because it's fun to get geeky about it. And that's a geeky crowd. So it should be good. Anything more to add on any of this stuff here, my friend? Not at the moment. Not at the moment. All right. Uh, I would love to talk about our first sponsor, if that's okay with you, my friend. Okay. Our first sponsor today is our newest sponsor, and that is Ops Genie, now by Atlassian. So Ops Genie is an engine that empowers your developers and your operations teams to plan for service disruptions, which are going to happen, and to stay in control during those incidents. Ops Genie gives teams the power to respond quickly and efficiently to unplanned issues, I think if it weren't for unplanned issues, Mac Geek Gab wouldn't have existed. So we know from those. Uh, Ops Genie also helps to notify all the right people through a combination of scheduling and different escalation paths that take into account things like time zones and holidays and who the right person is and who the right person is if the right person isn't available, that sort of thing. And now because Ops Genie is by Atlassian, it allows for deep flexibility in not only how, when, and where alerts are deployed, but is now supported by over 200 integrations like Jira, Amazon CloudWatch, Datadog, New Relic, and more, right? Integrates with all the Atlassian stuff, but because it's Atlassian, it integrates with everything. They are so open, it's ridiculous and awesome. And of course, Ops Genie tracks all the activity and provides useful insights to improve future incident responses, right? So it it learns and it helps you learn. And it's such a cool engine. And here's the coolest thing. You can go sign up for an account. This is a real account, not a trial account. No credit card required. You go sign up for an account. You now have a real account and you can have up to five team members, five users on that account for free. Not for free for a little bit, not for free to test it out, for free forever with that account. Visit OpsGenie.com to sign up for this free company account, add up to five team members. I'll say it one more time, OpsGenie.com. Never miss a critical alert again with OpsGenie. Our thanks to both OpsGenie and Atlassian for sponsoring this episode. Our next sponsor is... PDF pen software that is near and dear to my heart. I run a business that is super mobile. I am all over the place. I think I'm on an airplane at the moment. This actual episode releases. 
I am always on the move and I need to keep the business moving. PDF pen on my iPhone, on my Mac, on my iPad, it's all the same. It lets me do all of the things that I need to do with PDFs right there. Signing contracts. I did this on uh, Wednesday. I can't even remember what day it is anymore. Had a big deal come in last day of the month. It's always nice to have something come in under the, under the wire, but I had to get some signatures done and I was out running some errands because, you know, things happen. I'm also a human being. PDF pen let me get all this stuff done. In fact, I had to make some changes. I had to edit a PDF. I had to tweak some the way some pages were and move them, some things around, make some notes on it. In addition to my signature, I was able to do that all from my phone with PDF pen right there. Very, very cool stuff. And it got this deal done. You know, if you listen to this show, but especially if you listen to our small business show, you know, time kills all deals. So having the power to get it done right there on your phone, no matter where you are, could be the key between success and failure. You got to check it out. Go to smilesoftware.com slash podcast. That's the link. I know it sounds generic. Yeah, I guess it is generic, but it's intentional. Makes it easy for you. Smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Go and check it out. Go get PDF pen. You can do all your manipulation. You can even get PDF scan plus that uh, allows you to scan things and all of that good stuff. Go check it out now so that you have it when you need it so that you're prepared like I was prepared and you won't get caught. Check it out. Smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Our thanks to Smile. The great folks at Smile, including the new ones. <laughs> and PDF Pen for sponsoring the show. All right, John. Now we get to talk about something that's exciting to me. New Mac Minis, new MacBook Air, new Mac hardware. This is a good thing, right, my friend? Well, especially in the case of the Mini, because uh, they haven't... haven't uh... They haven't rolled out a new one in quite a while. Well, same they, with the yeah. MacBook Air. It's like, you know, it, it needed an update. It was in a weird spot in the product line. So, but let's talk about the Mini first. Um, so, <laughs> here's the, an interesting thing. We got this email um, from listener Lee, who says, okay, Dave and John, I have a choice to make. I have two options. I can, uh, option A, I can buy a 2018 Mac Mini with a 3.2 gigahertz six core i7, 32 gigs of RAM and a two terabyte SSD all direct from Apple for $32.99. Okay. He says, or option B, I can buy a 2018 Mac mini with the same processor and only eight gigs of RAM and only a 128 gig SSD from Apple for $10.99. Plus from OWC, I can get a two terabyte Mercury Extreme six gig uh, or six G, sorry, two terabyte six G SSD for $529. Plus a 32 gig memory kit from OWC for $330 plus for 20 bucks, an external uh, drive enclosure case with USB-C for that uh, two terabyte SSD for just 20 bucks. He says, and then take my girlfriend on a seven day cruise to the Western Caribbean with the remaining $1,321. What should I do? Listener Lee says. So in addition to being uh, not only accurate, but entertaining, Lee brings up a great point about these new Mac minis. They have user serviceable RAM, user replaceable RAM. It looks like it's not the easiest job, but it also looks totally doable. And Apple uh, appears to be sanctioning this, which is awesome. So, so awesome. So I think that's definitely the way to go, because with a Mac mini, you're not uh, you, you can replace the RAM. So great. And you it's not a mobile computer for at least not for most of us. And for most of us, stacking a hard drive on top of it, behind it, next to it, whatever, uh, is also not a big deal. And so you it doesn't matter if the boot drive is connected uh, internally or externally, you know, as long as you get a fast enough drive with the, the right interface and all that, which he's specked out here, you're in a gr you're in great shape. And it means that you can replace it when you need to and all of that good stuff. So this is I, I'm really stoked about this new Mac mini. Uh, it's you know, it's almost almost 
I know I'm going to get yelled at for saying this, John, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's like the Mac Pro Mini, right? Because it it's got quite a bit of quite a bit of juice in it. Um, and we'll talk about the CPUs in a minute here. I I went nuts. I dug in. I figured out what CPUs Apple's using, and we can talk about comparisons. But we'll, we'll get there. So I, I'm I'm curious because you're a Mac Mini uh, user, like you have a Mac Mini, John, and I'm I'm curious what you uh, what you think about this new thing. Oh, they basically, you know, boosted everything. Um, yeah. So where's mine? So it has USB three, so that's nice on HDMI, which I already have. Well, that, and that's um, the nice part. In addition to like like the the laptop line and now the iPads have moved to all USB C, but this Mac Mini has USB C and as you pointed out, USB three. So it's got USB A ports as well as USB C ports, which is cool. I think it makes mm-hmm. it really easy to plug stuff in. You don't need as many dongles or yep. any. So, um, yeah, here's the weird thing. Yeah. So, so two USB three ports, a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. I thought they were banning those, but <laughs> no, no, <laughs> they still have one on here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. HDMI, same as before. Um, yeah. Uh, USB C slash Thunderbolt three. I think this one is only Thunderbolt two. Right. And then you can get 10 gig ethernet, you know, faster ethernet. And then also the processors, of course, uh, you know, the RAM and, and the processors, they boosted those as well. Yeah. So I, I think it's what people were. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's a, yeah, I mean, they, they, you know, kicked it up a notch. It's uh it can be, if you have the money, it can be. Yeah. Yes. A power machine. Well, and that's sort of the beauty of it, right? Because price point starts at seven ninety nine. dollars Now, um, we uh i'll jump to uh to sort of the next topic on our list but it's not really the topic i just have to open up a new email because wes asked us you know can you give us a short course on the difference between all the intel processors in this new mac mini the i3 the i5 the i7 so for 799 you get a mac mini with a quad core i3 processor and the 8 gigs ram and the 128 gig hard drive that uh, that lee mentioned and and that I think we'll talk about the specifics of these processors in a minute. But but in general, I think the low end one is totally fine, like for for what most of us do. In fact, most of us are probably using machines with processors far less capable than that right now. Uh, then you can for 300 bucks, you can boost up to a um, six core i5 processor. And then for another well this is weird wait why if i'm at the so this doesn't make any sense so i can go oh because the i5 on their thing comes with a 256 gig ssd so for 300 bucks you can either bump up to an uh, an i5 and uh, double the size of the ssd or for 300 bucks you can just bump right up to the i7, which is a, also a six core processor, but a far more capable six core processor. So this is where it gets interesting on a pricing thing. I would spend that 300 bucks on the CPU all day long and not on the additional SSD, because as Lee pointed out, you can get lots more SSD externally. For, and, and as you pointed out earlier in the episode, John, right, you found a one terabyte SSD for 145 bucks. So... Like this is simple math. So let's talk about the differences between these uh, these processors here, because I think I think this is where it gets interesting. So there there are options, right? The i3, the i5 and the i7. If you go to Intel's page, as I did, you will find there are many, many, many options when it comes to each of the i3, i5 and i7. There's probably 20 or or more different, just slightly different things. And where these differences matter are on three, three plate in three places. One, this the speed of the CPU, which is pretty obvious. Number two, actually, it's more than three places. The number of cores, okay, but those are pretty obvious. They're right there. Then there are some features that are not quite uh, apparent, and and that's where that's where my number three came from. So there's hyper threading, which uh, there's hyper threading, there's turbo boost, and there's level three cache. So hyper threading means that your processor can 
use double the amount of cores that it says it has for some things. You won't quite get it. It'll appear in like iStat menus as double the number of cores, but it's not quite working that way. It's, you know, think of it as maybe 50 percent more of the cores in terms of the, the types of operations that can take advantage of hyper threading. Um, Turbo Boost is essentially where the processor can overclock itself when it needs to. So it can run slower, uh, which saves power, it saves battery too. And then when it needs to, it can, you know, if it's, if it's maxed out, it just cranks up its own uh, processor speed, which is cool. And then level three cache is the RAM that's baked into the chip. The way CPUs work is they take, uh, they read data from, you know, two places. They do a calculation and they spit the data out. If they can get that data from RAM that is stored on the CPU, that is faster. So that speeds things up. And the more RAM you have, the more data that can be stored in there. And you're not limited by having to go out across the motherboard bus to the actual RAM and, and, and get the data from there. I know that's an oversimplification, John, but I, did I get that mostly right? Is that just to kind of set the stage here? Yeah, I think that's right. And okay. um, visually, um, so the good folks at Intel and I, uh, you know, I think we'll, uh, well, you're going to post the link to this. Yeah. But uh, Intel actually has comparison charts for each of the uh, processors summarized nicely in a, in a PDF for each of the families. So, cool. um, so if you're curious about the differences, <clears throat> um, you can go there. Intel has the, the info on their page. They have a, uh, desktop comparison, and then uh, on the bottom of that, if you want to know about the mobile processors, so they break out their processors into two classes: mobile sure. processors for uh, you know for portable computers, and then desktop processors. And this is, of course, a desktop. Although, uh, the mini is a desktop, right. although very tiny, it's still considered a desktop computer. So here's the here's the thing: the i3 um, can support hyper threading. But this particular model that's that's offered in the three the, in the uh, new Mac mini does not support hyper threading. Uh, it also does not support turbo boost as no I threes do. So this three point six gigahertz four core I three is a three point six gigahertz four core chip. That's it. And it's got it's got, you know, a decent amount of level three cache. But the five and the seven have more. The five is a three gigahertz six core I five. The i5 line, and this is where things get weird, does not support hyper threading on any of the chips, including this one. So in that sense, it's like the i3 that Apple chose. Um, Turbo Boost, however, is supported on this i5, and that uh, can make things very interesting. And I'm, I'm looking up the specs here at Turbo Boost up to 4.1 gigahertz. So it's a 3 gigahertz, 6 core. Those 6 cores can Turbo Boost up to 4.1 and it has nine megs of level three cache versus the six on the i3. And then comes in the i7. This is a 3.2 gigahertz, six core i7. When you look at that, three gigahertz, six core i5, 3.2 gigahertz, six core i7, you'd say, well, why would I spend the money on the i7? When I'm finished, you'll say, why would I spend the money on the i5 when it's really not any different to go to the seven, especially if you're smart about the way you get RAM and CPU or RAM and, and storage. This i7 is a six core i7. It does support hyper threading. So it means that it can do six additional virtual cores, getting up to 12 cores for some operations. Uh, turbo boost is available. That turbo boost goes up to 4.6 gigahertz and it adds three more megabytes of level three cache to get to 12. So I would skip the i5 just because of the way Apple's packaging it and and putting it all together, I would skip the i5 all day long. You're either going to get the 3.6 gigahertz four core i3 and you're going to be happy. And, and most of us would be I, I, like I, I want to state that again. But if you're someone that thinks about keeping your machine for like 10 years or you do a lot of work on that computer that is CPU intensive. And to be frank, most of us do not. <laughs> but if you do. And you want sort of the Mac Pro Mini for that reason, or again for longevity, then this six core i7 is a no brainer uh, to, to go up to. Just the way Apple has packaged them, the i5 just doesn't make any sense. Uh, so, so uh, 
Uh, for most people, there might be some scenarios where you're like, well, no, I want all this stuff in here and the i5 is actually cheaper and blah, blah, blah. Yes. Okay, fine. Great. But uh, but otherwise, I think you're, you're going with the, the four core i3 or the six core i7 with hyper threading and turbo boost. And, uh, and there you go. I, 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 th I think I think that that gets us there, man. It took me like an hour, John, to pour through all of Intel's documentation and compare it with Apple's and find the chips they were using and which ones did which things. And oh, but we're there. We're good. So, yeah, I'm stoked about this. I, yeah, I may I may go. You should have found their comparison chart. <laughs> yeah, but their comparison chart. I mean, it was the, the comparison chart was the same. Right. I mean, it, yeah. you still have to, like, you know, narrow it down. They, I mean, the comparison mm -hmm. chart is on their website. Like, it, it's just it's mm -hmm. the same data is on their website. You just have to look and, and find and it's all right there. But uh, but yeah, it's pretty good. It's I mean, the only good. consideration. So, yeah, I think my reflection on my current mini, there are some things that I cannot do. OK, so the one thing that. that um. I was wondering about when they when they you know re-rolled the mini is are they going to do integrated or discrete graphics and it's integrated graphics it's Intel UHD graphics six thirty right will that do what you need maybe yes maybe um, integrated graphics are are typically wimpier than what we're going to call discrete graphics which is you know a, a separate fair GPU yeah. from like Nvidia or or, or someone like that yeah. Um, if you're doing a lot of graphics intensive work or you're, you're a, you're a big gamer, uh, integrated graphics may not do it for you. That's but, true. You know, yeah, there was one, one game I looked at one time on steam where they're like, Oh, nope, nope, nope. Sorry. Uh, this, this game will not run satisfactorily, um, or at all, uh, on integrated graphics in your Mac mini. Sorry. So you so, could though, with Thunderbolt three ports, you could add an e uh, external GPU and run your game graphics that, from that. Yes, they actually point that out. That that that's neat. I saw that on their uh, on yeah. their page. Like, well, what can you do with these ports? Well, you could do an eGPU. So, um, oh. as, I want to I want to circle back to something you said just before we get too far away from that. Um, you pointed out correctly that all of these CPUs support internal graphics, and it's the Intel UHD Graphics Six Hundred and Thirty. UHD is what the rest of the industry calls the thing that Apple has decided to name Retina. So it does support, obviously Mac mini doesn't have its own monitor. You need to get one, but it does support Retina displays. And there's that mono price display that I use down in the office. That's Retina. That's awesome. And it was like, you know, 300 bucks or something. So, um, so just bear that in mind that yes, now this does support Retina. So it's important and you can do, up to three displays, depending on uh, how how you want the resolution, or up to two displays if you're if you really want to go nuts with with one of them. So that's all detail on Apple's Mac Mini specs page. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm stoked about this thing, man. It's pretty good, I, I think. Anyway, yeah, and I think the other uh, the other thing is I don't think you'd be able to replace the SSD. I mean, it says it's a PCI. Yeah, I don't think so. no. SSD. You just do it externally. I wouldn't even bother trying because it's a the Mac Mini. One. Yeah, the inter why? Yeah, why bother replacing it? Just add an external one. It's save. I mean, it's you know, twenty bucks, right? To put a, a case around the the hundred forty five dollar one terabyte you found, and mm -hmm. and you just plug it into one of the USB C ports, and you're done. You're good to go. So yeah, yeah, because they uh, they do kind of nail you um, on their <laughs> SSD. Well, that's the thing. That's why that's why Lee is able to take his girlfriend on a seven day Western Caribbean cruise, man. Mm -hmm. You could either give the money to Apple or to Royal Caribbean. I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I might go I might go Royal Caribbean on this. <laughs> uh, but that's just me. You know, that's just me. Actually, I think I think there's a, a one of the PR reps from Apple just moved to Royal Caribbean. So maybe that's <laughs> maybe that's why Lee mentioned that. Who knows? Uh, yeah. While we're here, let's talk about the new MacBook Air, because this has been sort of interesting to me. And I it took me a little bit to wrap my head around what this machine is, because the new MacBook Air sits in a weird spot price wise. Right. It's uh, you get the you know, it's the 13 inch with with retina display. 
uh, which is awesome. Like finally a retina, you know, screen on a MacBook Air. Great. All day battery life. Great. But I started looking and it's like, okay, wait a minute. You know, uh, let me pull up this this data here because I want to make sure I have it right, my friend. But uh, but you know, you look at this and it's eleven ninety nine for the MacBook, the thirteen inch MacBook Air. Really though, if you want to go up to and and of course with a laptop, buying your RAM and storage from Apple is super important because you can't replace it and you don't want to have external storage on a laptop that you have to drag around with you. So 16 gigs of Ram and a 256 gig SSD, which I think is, is the the right configuration for many people. You might be able to get away with eight gigs of Ram. I don't think you're going to get away with less than a 256 gig SSD on a portable machine. Uh, you might even want more, but certainly 16, 256, I, I think is a good baseline for most of us. So the 13 inch MacBook air, which is a 1.6 gigahertz dual core, uh, eighth gen I five, Fifteen ninety nine, the thirteen inch MacBook Pro with a two point three gigahertz dual core seventh gen i five, sixteen ninety nine. It's like, wait a minute, for a hundred bucks, wouldn't you want to boost up to the uh, MacBook Pro with a you know a, a better better CPU? And here's the thing, John. I started doing some digging, and I am not convinced that the MacBook Pros. CPU is better. Um, and the reason is, if you look, that CPU that they have chosen for the MacBook Air, they're calling it a 1.6 gigahertz uh, CPU. And I have no doubt that's what it's clocked at, of course. But it also says on the tech spec page, and I'm going to pull this up just to make sure it hasn't changed and I haven't screwed anything up. That the CPU turbo boosts up to 3.6 gigahertz. That's a lot of turbo boost for a 1.6 gigahertz CPU to turbo boost all the way up to 3.6. So much so that it seems weird. And if you look at Intel specs, it is weird because the only i5 that matches all of their other specs there is a 2.3 gigahertz. CPU that turbo boosts up to 3.6. So I think this CPU in the MacBook Air is a 2.3 gigahertz CPU that they have downclocked to save battery life. Nothing wrong with that, but leaving all that headroom there up to 3.6 gigahertz if you need it. So this is a pretty powerful CPU in that thing. And it's lightweight and it's got good battery life and uh, you know, it's got those Thunderbolt three ports. Uh, it also, John, has a uh, it's got two Thunderbolt three ports, which are USB-C ports with Thunderbolt three. It's really the right way to think of it. And it's also got uh, a three point five millimeter headphone jack. Because, you know, you pointed that out before, so I had to check. So initially, my thoughts about this MacBook Air were a little lackluster, but the more I come around to it, it's like, ooh, actually, that's kind of a sweet little machine there. And it's thin and lightweight and all of that stuff. It's not that much lighter than a MacBook Pro, but it's a little lighter than a MacBook Pro. So if you don't need the and, and you get a touch bar right with this, which you don't with that particular base model MacBook Pro. So this is a very interesting machine. It 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 makes me wonder about the 12 inch MacBook which for the same config would be just a hundred dollars less, fourteen ninety nine, and that's a one point two gigahertz dual core uh, older series processor. I, I think I'd, I think this MacBook Air it starts to look nicer and nicer the more you dig into the details, which is again interesting. It's what we like to do here. So I'm curious to your thoughts on this, John. Um, I've never been really. Uh, I'm just not an Air type of person. It's just. So maybe maybe now it would be good. See, I, that's I what I'm saying. A pro person. I understood. I, I get well, just that. Just because the air, to, to me, always seemed kind of underpowered. Well, that was true up in a week ago when we released our last episode. That was true. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I agree with you also now is that there, now I think they're creating some confusion because now there's an overlap between, you know, it's like, well, why should I get the air versus the MacBook versus the, the pro? Right. Right. 
Yeah, I think if you're going for a dual core processor, um, you know, again, I, I, well, the Air is is definitely something to consider. There are reasons to jump to the Pro. You get better graphics in the, in some of the Pros, right? You can get, uh, you know, more. I don't know. Actually, can you get more RAM? I don't know that you can right now. Uh, you certainly can get the Touch Bar in in the higher, you know. Uh, uh, higher spec out pros of course with the 15 inch you can go to four cores that's totally different right you know but in it from a 13 inch laptop standpoint that air puts itself in a very very interesting place um and actually with you can get the quad core with the in the 13 too if you if you go up to the you know the the highest uh the highest 13 that they have so that you know it it, it certainly if you want that great but if you're looking at dual core I don't know, uh, you know, uh, like that MacBook Air, it's got the touch bar, it's got all that stuff. I, I, That's a very interesting machine. It's got great battery life. So, I don't know. It gets confusing. I, the Thunderbolt 3 on the, uh, on the quad-core MacBook Pros, it has two extra ports, and I'm 99% certain that those are on a separate bus, too. So you could balance things out and make that better. Um, whereas with the MacBook Air, they are it's just one bus, which is the same as the dual core uh, MacBook Pro, right? You get two ports and they're on one bus. In fact, you get exactly the same ports on, on the dual core stuff. So if dual core is your jam, I'm thinking the MacBook Air is a pretty good looking machine, except today. And, and by today, I mean generally right now. And the reason for that is the MacBook Pro is available on Apple's re, uh, uh, refurb store, whereas the MacBook Air, the new MacBook Air, is not yet available on Apple's refurb store. If timing, if past performance is an indicator of future predictions, I would say that it will be January, late January, you know, early February before we see the new MacBook Air is starting to pop up on the refurb store. So if you can wait until then, do it. If you can't, uh, you know. You pay 15% to have the computer for three months longer. Any more thoughts on that, John? Mm, I'll seriously consider it when I need to upgrade my MacBook Pro. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know. I, and I am, I, am in, I am in need of a new laptop. My son is also in need of a laptop. And I think it's time to replace my wife's iMac too. So there, there might be several purchases. I'm, I'm really curious. Every time in the past that I have gone to buy a MacBook, uh, sorry, a Mac Mini, I have spec'd it all out, and then I've looked at the iMacs and said, actually, that's a better deal since I have to buy a screen anyway. And I bought an iMac every single time. So I'm curious if that happens this time. I will keep you posted. For now, though, John, I would love to talk about our second group of sponsors, if that's okay by you. Please do. All right. I'd like to thank Ring for sponsoring Mac Geek Gab today. You've heard of Ring before. We've talked about them a lot. In fact, they're the company that really made it possible for me to wrap my head around the whole smart home thing and really see the value in the smart home thing. And, and this is true. If you've listened to other episodes, you know that this is not, you know, just shtick for the spot. No, no. Ring was the ring was the thing for me. I tested all sorts of other smart home things. Ring really grokked it. They made it easy. Their integrations made it easy. They started with the doorbell, right? And then the floodlight cameras. Well, they just reinvented the home alarm system. We all know that traditional alarm companies prioritize high monthly premiums, and they really like to tie you into those long-term contracts. So Ring changed that. Ring Alarm is an easy-to-install, affordable home security system, no long-term contracts. You build the system that's right for you, have it up and running in minutes. The Ring Alarm Security Kit comes with everything you need to protect your home and 24-7 professional monitoring, if you want it, is only $10 a month. It's really cool. I, like you got to check this out. It's it's it, I love having sponsors that have great products and great service behind them and all of that stuff. It makes 
everything easy for us and for you. So ring alarm really is a smarter way to protect your entire home. And the ring alarm security kit is available at ring.com and retail stores across the U.S. So go to ring.com slash MGG to learn how you can get whole home security for just 10 bucks a month. Again, that's ring.com slash MGG. As always, our thanks to Ring for doing what they do, for making life so easy, and for sponsoring this episode. Our next sponsor is Captera. You know, when you're trying to get something done, a client asks you to do something, your boss asks you to do something, your spouse asks you to do something, or you simply need to do something for, for yourself, but you're not sure of what software to use to get it done. Sometimes you write to us here at Mac Keycab, right? Sometimes you hopefully can try and remember, hey, what was that thing Dave and John mentioned that would do that thing I needed to do? And you can't remember. But we're all bound to face this, right? It happens all the time. Captera is here to help. Don't let finding the right software be one of the problems that you have to face this year and next year. Because with 2019, yes, 2019, fast approaching, you don't have time for these unexpected hurdles. None of us do. Things are moving fast right now. So you can find software for your business fast with Captera's new free book, The Big Book of Free Software, which, guess what? You can download for free at captera.com slash MGG. Captera.com is the free resource to help you find the software that you need for your business and for everything else. And with this helpful information on over 300 different tools, the Big Book of Free Software can help you find a completely free tool to test today. And as I said, in case it wasn't clear, it's absolutely free. So you won't have to ask for money or spend any money to do this. Whether you're looking for a new project management tool, recruiting software, email marketing solutions, Captera's big book of free software has something for you. Did I mention it's free? Visit captera.com slash MGG today to get your free copy of the big book of free software. Again, captera.com, C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash MGG. That's captera.com slash MGG. Our thanks to Captera for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, you want to go on to some questions? How about some photo stuff? Does that sound like a good thing to uh, dive into here? Well, the one thing I noticed. Yes. Uh, the, the, did you notice the uh, Easter egg in the uh, Mac Mini video? Oh, which, I did. Which Easter egg? Um, if you looked at the video, um, you know, they're showing it, you know, kind yeah. of looks like a spaceship and stuff. And there's a rotating ring of light below it. With yeah. dots and dashes, Dave. Hmm. Really? You know, maybe that's a code. Was it Morse and code? Yes, it was. And it says, hello, just like the first Mac. I thought that was really clever because I'm, I'm looking and I'm like, is that Morse code? That has to be Morse code. And it, is, it was Morse code. Did we write that up at, uh, at TMO? Uh, I tweeted about it. Dude, you I should write it up I as cool stuff before. found. Definitely. Dude, that's awesome. I love that. That's great. Yeah, I saw someone else in my feed notice it too. Yeah, it was, uh, I just thought it was it was, it was uh, something that most people wouldn't notice because yeah. it looked just like you know pretty lights. But uh, right, well, it was pretty lights, but it was it was also a hidden message. Yeah. Oh, dude, that's awesome. I love it. <laughs> pretty cool. All I had right. to look up the Morse oh. code though because my yeah. Morse code is uh, I only know a few. Yeah. Uh, I've only memorized a few. But. Mine's pretty rusty too. Yeah, it's not so good. Yeah, very cool. Nice find, man. Nice catch. All right, uh, jumping to the Mac Geekab forums over at macgeekab.com slash forums. Dan Thurston uh, asks, he says, I recently bought a Synology NAS and I want to migrate from Apple Photos to PhotoStation uh, on the Synology. My original photos are all in the cloud as I have optimized storage selected on my Mac and all of my iOS devices. What would be the best way to migrate all of my photos to the new Synology? Okay, so this is interesting. I've done this uh, several times, in fact, and it and I've done it, you know, different different ways. So the one way is that and frankly, I think this is the best way. 
install DS Photo, which is there. Now we're talking about Photo Station. I'm also going to talk about moments separately here. But if you want to use Photo Station, which is the old way of doing things there, uh, you would install DS Photo on your iCloud connected phone, iPhone, uh, and let it do the download then upload work, right? Because that's what's going to need to happen. These photos are stored in the cloud. One of your Apple devices is going to need to slurp them down from the cloud and then upload them to your Synology. So doing that with your iOS uh, device is frankly the simplest way to do it. I've tried all three of these and that it just works. It happens kind of automatically because your iOS device says, I need that photo. And then in the background, iOS says, aha, I should go get that photo. And it does. And it's all good. Everything works really well. Uh, the same exact thing works if you want to use Synology's Moments app, which is really what I would frankly recommend because Moments um, seems to be the future there. It's more like a Google Photos type of solution where it's doing a lot of auto processing for you instead of you having to manage all of your libraries uh, and albums separately. It kind of auto creates albums and does all of that stuff that none of us actually want to do. Uh, but either it works with either one. If you want to do this on your Mac, there are two ways to do it, and neither are great. Um, because you don't have all your originals downloaded to your Mac, you need to do that. You can either, uh, assuming you don't want to make any changes to your existing user account, you could create a separate user account. Um, I've done this, and you set that user account to download originals to this Mac. If you don't have enough room on your boot drive, no problem. You can create a separate uh, photo library on an external drive. You just hold down option when you start photos and it will do it. Uh, and then from there, set that as your iCloud library and it will just slurp everything down to that on the external drive. Then you will have them there. You'd have to show package contents to go into that and go uh, copy the masters folder over to the Synology, however you like and, and point either photo station or moments at that. Uh, and then it'll slurp all that data in and you'll be fine. Uh, a little more work, but you can do it on your Mac. The third way is to use Safari to download all of your photos from iCloud photos on the web. You just go to iCloud.com, go to photos, download your photos to a folder, and then slurp that into the disk station. That for you might be easier because it doesn't mean setting up a separate user account. So there you go. Um, that's that. That's what I've got. Oh, as Warren in the uh, chat room, John says, couldn't you just make the Synology the external drive and skip that step? Uh, yeah, you you could um, for the downloads. Yes. For your photos library, even with the separate user account. No, you cannot store a photos library on a network attached storage device. It has to be stored on a disc that is directly connected to your Mac, either internal or external photos will choke. You can sort of force it to do it and you will regret that uh, choice every day that you, that you live with it because it, it won't be good. I've tried it. I, I used to do that with iPhoto and it was mainly manageable, but not so with photos. So I think you've been through that too, right, John? Not recently. Yeah. Yeah. But for good reason. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So any other thoughts on this, my friend? No, nah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with, uh, with, uh, iCloud photo library, which I accidentally turned on one day. I was resistant to it. Well, the thing is you gotta, you know, fork over you gotta have enough money. storage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I got my entire library going, uh, going back many years. Uh, and it's like multiple gigabytes. So. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, I mean, it's a lot of data to move around. iCloud photo library makes it really, really easy. Um, if all your devices are Apple devices and compatible and all of yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe I'll give this a spin. Um, when I get my new Synology, which is on the way. Oh yeah. yeah you've got uh, that nine eighteen plus on the way, huh? Well, I went to their event and, uh, suggested, um, it'd be a good thing for them to give me a slightly newer one because, <laughs> Uh, the one I have here is a 713, which was made in 2013. Sure. So it's uh, kind of dated and kind of wimpy. Sure. No, um, that 918 would be for, good. It's great for storage, but you can't really do uh, 
you know, there's a lot of a lot of other things you could do with the Synology, like uh, virtualization, and uh, you know, as you pointed out, Plex and, and stuff like that. Which uh, well, we, we talked about the 918 last week, right? I mean, that's that's mm-hmm. basically become our top choice for for folks looking to get into the Synology realm that that really like want to do you know some level of heavy lifting with it. It, it. It's got that hardware transcoding engine in it, in addition to a relatively powerful CPU. And so those two things together open up, like you said, a lot of doors. So yeah, that, that, that DS918 plus very, I'm curious, really eager to, uh, to chat with you next week and, and, you know, hear what you think about it out of the gate. It's pretty cool, man. Pretty cool. I think you're going to make me jealous, but that's good. That's, uh, that's, that's what we're, we're good for that for each other. And I can use their new file system. That's another thing that. Yeah. Yeah. Would be kind are, of a, are you, I think are you going to? Uh, yeah, it's a BTRFS, I think they call it. Yes. It's like their next generation. It's um, their current generation, whereas, yeah, yeah, EXT4 was the previous one. But there's there's yeah. arguments against BTRFS, too, right, on a NAS. I mean, I, mean, I think it does a lot of things that uh, APFS does as well. Correct. You know, feeling and snapshots and, uh, you know, they described a lot of the uh, next generation features. I think, in theory, I could... Um, I could do it with my current unit, my 713, but I'd have to reformat it. They don't have a tool. There's no that migration the tool. file system. Yeah. Yeah. At least Apple has a migration tool. So migration I will mechanism. I will point you to um uh BTRFS versus, you know, EXT4 on NAS. Uh there's an article that now to be fair, it's an article from QNAP. So they have a vested interest in it, in this, but th- there's no reason they could use BTRFS. This is not a, 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 you know, this is not something that Synology has, has, you know, exclusive rights to or anything. Um, but they point out uh, a few things. They point out speed, which we've certainly seen with APFS that there's greater IO latency. And so APFS in general is, is slower for bulk transfers than HFS plus. On your desktop machine, that doesn't really matter as much, right? You know, you you want some of these other things like snapshots and that. And most of us aren't don't really care about getting the ultimate performance out of our devices. But with NAS, you sort of do. And so BTRFS, they say that EXT4 is 61% faster than, you know, than BTRFS. Ooh. Yeah. Um, they also point out that because, you know, B, like you said, BTRFS supports snapshots. But because of that, it can't separate volumes for storing data and snapshots. Snapshot files live on the system storage space. And that, according to them, increases the difficulty of storage management and puts some of that data at risk, right? Because it's all in the same spot. Um, And performance, you know. So anyway, I'll I'll put a link to, uh, to, to, to that. And you, you can all read oh, okay. that. Yeah. I, I, okay. I, I haven't made the transition, not because of this, but because I don't want to have to reformat my drive. Um, but this makes me feel better about not having yet done that. <laughs> so, but I don't know. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, the other thing that occurs to me is that if, uh, is that if you do uh, uh, certain types of raid, that kind of gives you uh, a performance boost. So. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So I, I think that the, having a raid uh, may mitigate some of the uh, some of the performance loss. Uh, no, no, because they're testing. I mean, that 61 percent oh, faster right. was BTRFS on a raid versus oh. versus mm-hmm. EXT4 on a raid. No, 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 no. It, it definitely slows it down. And that's not surprising. Again, you know, and again, again. In in the raid scenarios, where you would want that speed, so I don't know. I, I'm curious what you think after you go through that, and I will ask you next week what you chose. And I won't like I I don't know that there's really a a clear answer here. So so anyway, you know, it's interesting. Right. Makes life interesting. I know it, it throws a curveball at you. I I felt the same way when I kind of got the same curveball. It's like oh. Crap. I thought this was I thought this was a no brainer. Like I thought I definitely wanted to do this, but no. Uh let's see. Let's go to uh let's go to Felix here. Felix says, uh, in my photos app, I, I am getting an error that uh basically anytime he says 
uh, it's weird. He gets a, a big triangle inside photos that like when he clicks on a thumbnail, he can't see the actual photo. He says, uh, most of my photos are coming in via iCloud from photos taken on my phone. He says, I have ample storage space, uh, almost 600 gigs available free on his system where his photos library is located. And he says, I have 200 gigs free in his iCloud account. He says, would this have anything to do with the nearly full symbol next to the iCloud tab, which um, I don't know that I'm seeing anywhere, but uh, oh, I see what he's saying. No, that's actually actually that's not it's not showing nearly full. It's showing nearly downloaded. It is a um, when you are when you are looking at iCloud Drive on your in the finder, it will show you how much of that it has synced. And his has not finished sinking. So it's showing a little sliver of the pie free. Uh, and that's not good. Yeah. So it it's looks like almost done. It's almost finished. Quite. Yes. Right. And so it seems like something with iCloud is just not syncing properly on his on his Mac. I, I think and that goes beyond just photos. It looks like his iCloud drive is suffering from this, too. That said, you could try repairing your photos library. I mean, this, these two things might only be coincidental and not actually related, right? So it is worth doing that. Um, we'll, we'll link to a knowledge base article that uh, that describes what you can do to repair um, a photos library. But essentially, it involves holding down option and command while clicking to launch photos. So quit photos. Hold down option and command and then launch it or launch it and hold them down real quick afterwards after you click it. Uh, and and then it'll give you options, including uh, one that allows you to repair the library. As always, make a backup first. It just goes without saying. I know you have your photos stored in iCloud. Maybe that's enough of a backup for you. Uh, th that's your decision to make. But feel like you have a backup before you start repairing the library. Um, failing that. Uh, you know, it, I, the next thing actually that I would do is I would go in to iCloud system preferences and completely log out of iCloud on your Mac, restart your Mac, log back in. Uh, I feel like there, you know, there is an iCloud problem going on. You want to solve that thing that's happening with the Finder as well. Once you do that, if you still continue to have problems with photos, then then we've troubleshot it. And now we know it's a photos library problem. Um, you could delete your photos library on your Mac. Really, you could just create a new one and have it sync down to that. And once that's all happy and successful, then you could throw away the old one. That would that would be one simple way to do it. It would take a little bit of time, obviously, for the download and all that. Um, or if you really believe that there's a problem with your photos library and you don't want to go through the whole re-download for whatever reason you could use something like power photos to try and merge everything that you have into a new library and hopefully that you know rebuilds whatever whatever ain't right about the the caches or you know file links or anything like that any thoughts on that john no i think you you covered it it's uh Yet another case of turning it off and on again. He fixed the problem. Or I, I knew that that was going to be one of the things you would suggest. Yeah. <laughs> well, with iCloud, it really is the simplest way to do it. Obviously, it's a needle in the haystack problem, right, man? Like, you know, there's something wrong. And if you knew exactly what it was, you could go in and manipulate that one little file and either rebuild it or fix it or change it or whatever. But... It sure is faster unless you already know exactly what it is. Um, it sure is faster. And the problem with, with iCloud is there's so many different layers of, of the sync process, right? It's not like there's, you know, the clouds version and then just the version on your hard drive. That's what it seems like. But with some iCloud data, there's also a cache of the clouds truth on your hard drive that then syncs locally. So the, the cloud's truth syncs separately. And then once you have that locally, then that syncs. So there's actually two sync processes happening and that can get to be a big major headache. So, yeah. Yeah. I wonder if, it, I wonder if this could have happened during, um, I think you may have 
noticed, as many of us did, that uh, a while ago there was an iCloud meltdown, I'll call it. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, sure. Yeah, and how do you know about these things? Well, I'll tell you, Dave, if you want to see if uh, iCloud is having problems, Apple has a link to service sta system status. Uh, it's apple.com slash support slash system status. And you'll see a little dot next to all of their services, mm. whether it's uh, whether it's working or not. Actually, I'm looking right now and it says iCloud mail resolved issue. So if you're having a problem with your iCloud mail, it could be because they just resolved the issue. <laughs> Depending on when you're listening, yeah. of course. Yeah. When I, yeah. when I saw this page, oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it was like a week ago or something, but yeah, it was like everything was like yellow or red. It had iCloud next to it. <laughs> Look, looked like the uh, departures board at O'Hare during a snowstorm, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not pretty. Uh, all right. And then one last photo is one, again, from the forums over at MacGeekab.com slash forums. Flyleaf writes, my wife and I currently keep our full resolution photos on our respective MacBooks. But this has gotten to be too much data to keep storing on our internal SSDs. So we want to move our personal photos libraries to a shared Mac mini where they will be stored on one very big external hard drive, which itself is backed up to two time machine drives that take turns being offsite backups. We will most likely use either PhotoStream or iCloud photo library to get all the new photos onto the mini. Makes perfect sense. In either case, he says, I believe this means that we need to run two separate user accounts on the mini each one being logged in at all times with the Photos app running. But how do I force both user accounts to reopen automatically at system boot, for example, after a power outage? With PhotoStream in particular, failing to reopen the second user account for too long could lead to lost photos. So I'm not saying it's likely, but I can imagine not noticing or forgetting, and then the second account needs to be logged in manually. Alternatively, is there a way to keep both Photos libraries automatically syncing from a single user account on the Mac? Uh, no. And he says, to be fair, I don't want to merge two libraries into one. Uh, yeah, you're right. Um, so your thought process is totally valid here. Uh, getting one account to auto login is no problem. Uh, it's the second one where that would be an issue. And so I'll throw that out as a geek challenge. I don't know how to get a second user account to auto login. Um, I'm trying to think now there's I'm trying to think if there's automation software that comes to mind that would do that. And no, because once you you have to log out uh, to do that, what you could do is use something, you know, linking to uh, you could have keyboard maestro do something or or even just have an app that launches at startup, like set your set one user account to auto login. Right. And then build an Apple script or an automator or, you know, anything that auto launches and triggers something like, say, Boxcar to notify your iPhone that the Mac has rebooted and logged in. And now you need to go back to the Mac and log in as the second account. That would be one way to do it. Uh, yeah. Um, but I don't. I don't know about anything else. And and you're right. The, the user accounts do need to be logged in for iCloud photo library to sync. Uh, and also for photo stream. I'm certain that with iCloud photo library, though, the photos app itself does not need to be running. That syncing happens in the background. It's been too long since I've run photo stream, but I seem to remember that photo stream also would sync in the background of a logged in account. I could be wrong about that, though. So you, you, it's safer to just have photos running. Yes, I'm pretty sure of that. Yes, pretty sure of which 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 stream, part? The, the photo stream. Photo stream auto downloading with, with or without photos running, or it needs to be running. No, the the my experience is that it doesn't. Mm. It right. doesn't have to be running. Right. Right. Okay, yeah, that like makes sometimes sense. If I yeah. open my, yeah, like sometimes I'll take a screenshot and then you know if I go to another machine and open photos, it's it's there already because right. it's 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 doing its thing. Right. As we've discussed in the past, uh, photos likes to do things in the background sometimes to <laughs> to your disadvantage. Oh yeah, it's crazy, man. Well, that's why I use app. It's like who's taking all my processor? And it's like, yeah, then you look and you, and you see photos D. I think is uh, or, or photo library process. D or something. Yeah, yeah. Yep. No, I use app tamer to keep that at bay, uh, which is awesome. Uh, 
Uh, because you can say, no, 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 if it starts using more than whatever, 15, 10, 20, 30, 60 percent of your process or whatever you choose. Boom. Just nope, throttle it down. Hold hold it steady there and let it do its thing. But don't let it consume my entire system. Makes a huge difference on, you know, I've got a couple of 10 and actually I think even 11 now year old IMAX at the house that, you know, otherwise would just be bogged down by all these new things that are running. So there you go. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Very cool. But yeah, as long as you can have those two user accounts logged in, you can, you can get that done. It's good. It's good. Brian Monroe in the chat room points out that you can, and I, I would just, I actually sort of presume that they would use optimized storage for the photo libraries on their respective MacBooks so that they have access to them. But the, the data itself is being stored, uh, offloaded to the cloud when necessary. So yeah, very cool. Good, good stuff. John, I want to take a minute and thank all of our premium uh, contributors who contributed in the last week. As you well know, MacGeekUp.com slash premium is where you go. If you are willing and able uh, and interested in supporting us directly, and if you are not, that's okay too. You know, go visit our sponsors. As I always say, our job is to get you to want to learn more about them. Uh, whether or not you purchase is really truly between you and them. Uh, it, it does not, we don't get a cut of the take of any of that stuff or anything. It certainly looks better for us if, if you wind up buying, but we don't expect you to buy something that you're not interested in, but we do hope that we've generated some interest at least in finding out more. So there's that. But if you're interested in premium, MacGeekUp.com slash premium is where you can go. The folks that have uh, contributed, whose contributions have come in, in the last week include, uh, Lee M with a hundred dollar one time donation. Uh, and then on the monthly $10 plan, we have Joe BP, Tony Z, Ev the Nerd, Robert D, Nick S, Beth B, Ward J, Olga P, Jason A, and Stephen A. And in the biannual $25 plan, we have Mike H, Charles K, Robert R. Uh, wait a minute. I am, I didn't. I'm I'm thanking people from two weeks ago too. That's okay. Robert R. Run KMC, Keith M, Thomas S, Chuck J, James H, Mark W, Lou R, Stevie D, Wayne B, Tony C, Trent N, and Doug A. So I I, I didn't wind up clearing the queue, but that's okay. I'm happy to say thank you twice to some of you, and that's totally fine. Thanks, in fact, to all of you who uh, either have contributed in the last week or premium members who have contributed at any time in any way. We really, really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you who have uh, contributed your questions and your tips and the folks of you that visit the forums at MacGeekCab.com slash forums. It's all truly fantastic. So really, really good stuff. John, do you have anything to, uh, to add here? I know we've got all kinds of other questions that we're surely not going to get to, but we could go to, we could do Maybe one more or, or not. We're right up, right about at our end mark. So, so what do you think? Mm. Mr. Braun, did I lose you? Oh, okay. No, You're no, right. I'm here. All right, good. Uh, maybe one more. All right. Let's, you want to go to Mike? That's sort of a fun one, huh? Let's see. <laughs> Where is Mike? So Mike, um, Mike sent in this question. He said, uh, for the last couple of years, my mid 2010 MacBook pro has been spontaneously restarting. He says I'm current on software. I've done nothing but in place upgrades of Mac OS since I got the first, since I first got the machine he says, I was hoping that Mojave would contain the patch for my problem, but it is not available for my pre 2011, uh, MacBook pro he says I've compared several panic logs, but I can't make sense of what it's trying to tell me. Can you give me a hand? He says, what do the logs suggest might be the source of the problem? He says, I'm not using the same app at the time of these kernel panic attacks. He says, the most recent one, I was an automator, which I run only for a few minutes once a month. Any help would be appreciated. All right, Mike. So I, we, we he, and Mike sent us a zip file of four or five different panic logs from times that this happened. So there's lots of data in these kernel panic logs, folks. And, and a lot of it is completely irrelevant to us as end users, but it is good, especially when you have problems and you can look and start comparing between them. 
And I started to do that. And I really narrowed it down. These are like three page long reports, maybe longer. But there's two lines in, in each one that that for him seem to really matter. The first, I look at where there's breaks, like text breaks, you know, line breaks in in these reports that can often be it's the start of a new section. And sometimes the line at the beginning of the section is helpful, but also sometimes the line at the end of the section is helpful. So that's why I focus on those areas first, John. And at the top of each of them, uh, there is a line that has lots and lots of stuff, but at the very start of it lists the problem and it says GPU panic. Then there's a second line that's sort of at the bottom of that first section in his panic reports that says BSD process name corresponding to current thread on his, these process names were all different in all five reports. One was finder. One was pages. One I think was automator. It didn't matter, but they were all different, but they were just the names of apps. So to his point, he was correct. It wasn't related to any specific app that was running, but it could have been, it could have been something in the background that would have actually been good. Because unfortunately, the one thing that's consistent between all of his reports, John, is those two words or that 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 line that starts with GPU panic. And I hate to say it, but I think your GPU is failing. That's your graphics processing unit. It is your graphics chip for lack of a different term. And to be perfectly honest, John, I, I, I don't know about your experience, but Mine says that that is the most commonly failed motherboard component on Macs these days. And not just these days, for the, but for the last 15, 20 years. If something on the motherboard is going to overheat and fail, it is the GPU first in most cases. Unfortunately, uh, on that machine, it's all soldered to the same place. There's not a separate GPU. There's not a separate CPU that you can take out and replace. So you're, you're probably looking at a motherboard replacement. Um, and that's not an inexpensive repair and, and, and it really may, you know, to, to borrow a term from the auto industry, it may total the machine. You, you just might not be worth buying that in lieu of buying a separate machine. That's, yeah. that's my thought. I mean, you, you can do something like resetting the SMC and that wouldn't be a bad thing to try. Right. You know, there's, there's these few little hail Mary things and reset the SMC and reset the NVRAM or the PRAM. Uh, we'll put links in the show notes to those for sure for you. But uh, I'm not hopeful, unfortunately. Thoughts, John? Yeah, I remember it was a, a past MacBook that I had that actually, when I sent it to Apple Care, um, and they returned it to me. One of the things they did was replace the or uh, the replacer. I think they replaced the motherboard because there was a GPU issue. Sure. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yep. And it was a known issue. Because they actually, uh, yeah, I think it was NVIDIA had some sort of problem. And so Apple would, you know, nail them for, for the repairs because the, at some point they had a bad batch of uh, sure. GPUs. And the machine is too old to have a repair program for that. Right, time. right. Or if it did, uh, that time has passed. So you got a, got a good run. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that's right. I, I mean, I had this iMac that's in front of me here years ago and, uh, you know, right about Christmas time. It's GPU failed and we replaced the power supply and all that. It was a crazy repair. And then they replaced the CPU, which has the GPU on, on the, on the board. It's a separate GPU, but it was all in one, you know, one part that Apple would replace and they replaced it with the wrong CPU speed, the slower version. So that was a fun thing. Some of you may remember long time listeners, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of how it goes. Unfortunately, it, it, my brother for years, had a philosophy, especially when, you know, when buying Macs, you, you sometimes, and you used to even more frequently, be able to choose between the low-end graphics card and the high-end graphics card. And for this reason alone, he would always buy the high-end graphics card. And his theory was, I, I don't do much with graphics, so I'm not going to tax this new card, and I'm going to tax it less than I would the lower-powered card, and so hopefully it won't overheat as much, and... I will get more life out of it. And I have to say, I don't know if that was that turned out to be the reason, but his Macs never had problems with their GPUs. So there you go. Yeah, and I'm going to uh, 
I'm going to link to a- Apple has an article here, which I'm okay. going to link to, which actually has some advice. And it says, if your Mac spontaneously restarts or displays a message that it restarted or shut down because of a problem. That's the title and, of the article. Yep. Wow. <laughs> and, um, nice. and yeah, it has a whole bunch of uh, things to help you determine is a hardware is a software, um, um, things like that. Sure. So, um, sure. Check that out. If you ever have crazy, crazy Mac doing crazy stuff. Like that. Yeah. That's yep. nuts, man. That's a long title, but, you know, descriptive. So there you go. All right, folks, let's see. Uh, we want it. We didn't haven't told you how to contact us. It, we did mention all of our premium subscribers. If you are a premium subscriber, premium at MacGeekab.com is the address to send things into. If you are not a premium subscriber, that's OK. Like we said, feedback at MacGeekab.com is the address to send things into. Um, did, did I hear you say feedback? At MacGeekab.com? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I said feedback at MacGeekab.com just to, just to get it right there. Very much so. And if you'd like to leave us a message, you can call us 224-888-GEEK. And John Geek is? 4335. As always, I want to thank the folks at Cashfly, C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. And, of course, I want to thank all of our sponsors, uh, of which there are thankfully quite a few this week and and actually coming up and all of that stuff. It's great. Uh, The ones that we had in this episode, of course, OpsGenie, O-P-S-G-E-N-I-E.com. PDF pen at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Ring.com slash MGG. Captera.com slash MGG. The good folks at Barebones Software at barebones.com. And, of course, Otherworld Computing at maxsales.com. Very, very good stuff. All through the Backbeat Media Podcast Network. John, you got us started with this mess today. What do you have to say to get us out? What I have to say to get us out is advice that you should all follow, no matter what you do. And that advice is don't get caught. made up.